Well, hello, sir. I heard you have some ancient publications I could, uh... Oh. Oh my... Oh my goodness. What? Is there something wrong with my arms or... Or something? You you want to say something about it, or...? No, no, no. I'm just... I'm just, uh, looking for those old publications. <laughs> well, luckily for you, I know exactly what you're talking about. Are you talking about these? First announced back in the ancient year of... 2009? world's most passionate gamers have all come together in Anaheim, California. The big day is here. Anticipation is high as we get set for this extraordinary television event. It's BlizzCon 2009, live on DirecTV. Let me teleport you back to the year 2009. World of Warcraft is at its peak subscriber count, and at that year's annual was crazy. World of Warcraft Cataclysm gets announced. Ozzy Osbourne is also playing there live and kidnapped a small Asian child and the best part of any BlizzCon? The dance contest. But I'm getting off track. Point is World of Warcraft is really, really popular at this time. And at this BlizzCon, they announced World of Warcraft the magazine. Yes, for only $39.05, you can get a magazine filled with WoW info every season. What a steal. I wonder what is in these- And the magazine was canceled only after five issues. But why? What are in these ancient magazines from a bygone era? Is it really that bad? Well, there's only one way to find out. The first edition of the World of Warcraft magazine was timed around the five-year anniversary of WoW, and what was cool about this issue and all the ones following it is it's very community-focused. Truth is, we're wholly dedicated to finding new angles on Azeroth rather than simply telling you how to play. We're going to show you a wide variety of options on enjoying, exploring, and extending the game's fun beyond the borders of the screen. You know Mike Morheim as the co-founder of Blizzard, but what about Mike the Musician? Or Mike the Poker Pro? This issue is full of strategies, lore, and advice from expert players, profiles of your fellow adventurers, as well as insight from the game's development team. But it might not all appear in the forms you'd expect. That's our goal, anyways. So this was released after Kata was announced, so a lot of the magazine is filled with info about the upcoming expansion and how just freaking amazing it's going to be. It talks about the world revamp and all the cool new leveling, and even has an interview from J. Allen Brack himself. Will the game feel any less epic without the long quests that send you all around the world? If by epic you mean annoying... You think you do, but you don't. One example that comes to mind are the quests to get your shaman totems. That's especially annoying. That is especially annoying! For people who have done that, it's like a rite of passage. I got my totems, and I did it the hard way. There is value in that, and that's like the people who beat the original Nax and Kel'Thuzad. Yeah, they did it the hard way back when it was hardcore and all that stuff, but I don't think that's the approach that a lot of players enjoy. The majority is turned off by that. So you can tell this was when WoW was heading toward its more casual approach, obviously. There are also a bunch of pages talking about features that were never even added to the game. Guild talent trees? Never added and turned into guild perks instead. Path of the Titans? A feature that was supposed to be added in Kata to progress your character post-max level, which was supposed to add a 20% character power increase over the course of the expansion? Never added. 
Also in this section here, it talks about how there will be new cities for trolls and gnomes. I guess you can kind of count the troll section in Orgrimmar as a new city, but the gnomes still haven't taken back Gnomergon to this day. All of the magazines are filled with community post-like stuff. Like here, where it's a bunch of players talking about all the companion pets they have. You might be wondering, how can you make multiple issues of a magazine talking about WoW be actually informational and have value? Well, um, to be honest, it's filled with a bunch of fluff stuff like this. This magazine was released before the last patch of Wrath of the Lich King, so Ice Crown Citadel. So there's a section going over all the lore and all the new dungeons and the raid. Apparently, Ice Crown Citadel wasn't released all at once. Instead, it was released in wings, where one wing would come out each week, and I didn't even know that was the case. But by far, my favorite portion of this issue is the booty call section. It's a bunch of opinion pieces from players on what system they use to distribute loot in their raids. So you know, you got Sean over here who uses need and greed and he says, need slash greed fills my needs. <laughs> or you got Jason over here who uses DKP and he's all like, DKP works for me. And then you got Kathy over here saying, in our guild, suicide is painless. She uses a system called Suicide Kings, by the way. Since this was the five year anniversary edition, there is a section here recapping the game's history. It's all pretty basic stuff, but they also highlight important historic events like owls invade the internet. Oh really? Yeah, really. Or President Bush officially discovers the internets. Taze on day bathes YouTube in chocolate rain. And, can you hear me now? Integrated voice chat debuts. Barely functioning, by the way. Many players use it to repeat Leave Billy alone! And Don't tase me, bro! Until you log off. So, as you can tell, uh, this has dated very, very well. The rest of this issue is filled with lots of guides for raids, battlegrounds, and add-ons. Stuff that isn't super interesting, and also stuff that you can just find on... I don't know, the internet. For example, there is a guide for the Trial of the Grand Crusader, which is cool, but this raid came out August 4th of 2009, and the magazine came out in the winter of 2009. So the guide wasn't even useful for many players, probably because the raid was already out for a good couple of months. So you can kind of see some problems emerging on why this magazine failed. So. Let's just move to issue 2, which came out in the spring of 2010. This issue opens up with an interview from the Quest designer team. A total of 6 devs are interviewed, 3 of which don't work at Blizzard anymore, which is understandable seeing as this came out over a decade ago. The interview talks about past quests they've made and the process of creating new ones for the most part. It says here that only 5% of the time they spend on developing quests is focused on story, and I'm sure this must have changed over the years, because if you look at more modern expansions like Shadowlands, the questing experience is incredibly narrative driven. It seems like back then the remaining 95% of development time involved standing around a map and playing with action figures in the break room. My favorite story they talk about is the issue they had with the quest, The Alchemist's Apprentice, which is a quest in Zul'Drak. This quest involved collecting a bunch of ingredients, but the only problem is, some of those ingredients were put on the top shelf, and smaller races like gnomes could not reach them, making the quest impossible to do. Let's see here, what else? Um, oh, an advertisement. You are going to see a lot of these as we delve deeper into the issues of this magazine, and this one is about plushies. <laughs> Neat! And speaking of advertisements, here's one about figure prints. This was a service where you could get your own WoW character 3D printed so you could display it in a physical form. The 3D printing we know of now is created by layering materials like plastic and nylon. But this version of 3D printing was made with plaster powder, giving the statues a more grainy appearance, and they were also incredibly fragile. You can find lots of horror stories on the internet about people's figures showing up broken or not showing up at all. If you visit the Figure Prints Facebook page comment section, it's filled with frustrated customers that have been waiting over two years to get their figure shipped. 
Despite all this bad press, I got one of these figures back when they were first announced way back when. It's a model of my first ever max level character, and I like to keep it on my bookshelf to make sure that my virginity is protected and no women may ever enter my room. Over here we have an interview with a guy that got to level 80 as a pacifist, meaning he killed zero players and mobs. He leveled up by exploration XP, profession quests where he swapped professions to repeat the quests a total of 13 times, he did quests that involved interacting with corpses that were slain by other players, he created a total of 248 Dark Moon Fair decks, he did fishing, and battlegrounds where he only healed friendly players and threw bombs at enemy players to stun them. When questioned about doing battlegrounds, his defense was, real life pacifists like Desmond Doss were medics during wars, uh, so apparently that means that he isn't breaking any rules. And when asked if fishing counts as killing, his defense was, um, no. Still, even if you think he broke the rules of this style of gameplay, it's still very commendable for the sheer amount of patience it requires. The rest of this issue is... Guides. Guides for engineering. Battlegrounds. Ice Crown Citadel. Killing enemy faction leaders. Add-ons. Guild leading. Three manning old classic raids because... I, I don't know, why not? Other than that, this is pretty much it for this issue. Oh wait, wait, there is a community artist spotlight portion where there's an artist named Marie Cannabis. Okay, okay, now we can go on to issue 3. Issue 3 was released in the autumn of 2010, so Kata still hadn't released, so it's still talking about how amazing the expansion will be. And at the end of this opening statement, they link their Twitter. And man, looking at a Twitter account from 2010 is an experience. Send us any questions you have about the magazine, WoW, video games, or anything. Let's call it an unofficial Comic-Con WoW Mag Twitter panel. Zero likes, zero comments, or retweets. And unsurprisingly, this account has been inactive since July 24th of 2011. This issue opens up with an interview with Chris Metzen, who is basically the father of WoW's universe, as well as all of the other Blizzard universes. A lot of the interview talks about how unique it is creating a narrative for an MMO, where it's a never-ending story, and you get a live reaction as the narrative unfolds. It's super interesting stuff that I think deserves its full video in the future, but Chris also talks about developing a Warcraft movie project, which was first announced back in 2006, where Sam Raimi would be the director. For Spider-Man, he made changes and adjustments where he needed to, to fit all of this into something that would read in this day and age, and also be compelling in a two-hour window. Now this movie didn't come out, but it makes you wonder, what would a Warcraft movie, created by the same director as the original Spider-Man films, look like? Pizza time. Mm -hmm. Another cool interview is one with the itemization team, the people who are responsible for coming up with all the gear available in the game. Out of the five people interviewed in this, two of them still work at Blizzard. It goes over the basics of what the workflow is like for creating items, it's lots of Excel spreadsheets and mathematical planning to make sure everything is balanced correctly, Apparently, it also involves standing around in an empty theater and playing with toy weapons. But there's also the fun side of creating items. They talk about their favorite items, stuff like the steamy romance novel. The first romance novel was released back in The Burning Crusade, but these horn dogs at Blizzard, they just keep producing them to this day, and now there's a total of 15 steamy romance novels that can be pickpocketed off of NPCs within the world. They also talk about items like the Unstoppable Force and the Immovable Object, both signature items in Classic WoW, as well as the Stoppable Force, a gray two-handed mace that is completely useless. But by far, the most interesting part of this interview is the items they wanted to put in the game, but it didn't really work out. We've had a lot of talks about class weapons over the years, and I'll say this. They're fun, and we'd love to do more, but they're also time-intensive, and in the current environment, they would be much harder to implement in a way that feels as it did back when the original Rock Dalar and Benediction were implemented. I spent a bit of time when we were working on Wrath of the Lich King trying to flesh out an artifact system. 
including how it would impact raid progression or item progression in the game. And there are all these crazy ideas of how your weapon leveled up. Yeah, toying with ideas like weapons leveling up, which would have been fun up until the point you realize you're never replacing your weapon. So eventually, we decided that World of Warcraft didn't need that. Seems like the development team kind of did a 180 a couple years after this statement, as the Legion artifacts are exactly what they are describing way back when, and I'd say that the Legion artifacts are one of, if not the best part of that expansion. Now, the rest of this issue is... It's bad. Guides. Lots of guides for battlegrounds and professions, some lore stuff, advertisements for action figures, and a real-life doom hammer that you can buy for $400. I'll spare you the uninteresting details of all this fluff, and we can move on to issue 4, the final magazine in this volume. This issue came out after Cataclysm finally released, so a good chunk of it is just talking about all the new zones and dungeons and stuff. A decade ago when this came out, this was probably very interesting, but now it's like, uh, yep, mm-hmm, that's, uh, that's Oldham, all right. Let's see, what else? We got a, a section talking about pop culture references, if that's your kind of thing. Who's that Pokemon? It's Pikachu! It's Clefairy! Ah, okay, here we go, something interesting. Here we have an interview with five creative minds behind the Blizzard cinematic team. Currently, three of them still work at Blizzard, but the others have moved on to AAA projects, which makes sense because Blizzard is well known for their incredibly well-made cinematics. In this interview, we get to learn about the workflow of creating these pieces of work and get some behind-the-scenes shots, too. The first step in creating a cinematic is the game team brainstorming an idea with the cinematic team on what the cinematic is going to entail. Once an idea is thought up, then it goes to the concept artists that sketch things out and get a good idea for the feeling of the project. They establish things like look, colors, and composition. Then it moves to the manufacturing portion, which takes the most time and is by far the most technical portion. This involves creating set pieces, rigging models, and painstaking frame-by-frame -frame animation. Finally, it goes to the VFX team to create things like particle effects, lighting, and colors. And that is where you start to see the finished product. Sometimes these cinematics can have an iceberg-like effect where you kind of forget how many people are really working on these incredibly large-scale projects, where the finished product is only a short film's worth of beautiful footage that is months and months in the making. In this edition, there's also a little section with cooking recipes, which is an idea Blizzard would later develop into a full-fledged cookbook, and the rest of this issue is boring. It's, it's really boring. We got stuff for toys, lore, an advertisement for Jinx, fan art, just... Okay, you, you get the idea. So these four issues complete Volume 1 of this magazine. Now, Volume 2 did release, but only one issue was created before the entire magazine was cancelled. I don't have that one because the guy on eBay I bought this from only had these four, so maybe I can talk about that in another video. So what happened was people paid $39.05 for these four magazines. Then they paid another $39.05 for one magazine, and then it was cancelled. So to refund people, Blizzard offered your money back, or you could get six in-game WoW pets, or you could pay more money and get six in-game WoW pets and a two-year sub to PC Gamer, or you could pay even more money and get six in-game pets, two years to PC Gamer, and an exclusive Murloc plush that was only sold at So you can probably tell why this magazine failed. A lot of the content in these pages are not exclusive, and the stuff that is, is few and far between. Perhaps if they added something like exclusive codes for in-game stuff, it would have found a bit more popularity, but also in the early 2010s, physical media was starting to head out the door because of the constant development of the internet and technology with things like iPhones and Kindles. So these magazines, they remain as a time capsule. A time capsule of an important turning point in World of Warcraft's history, but also a turning point for the way people consume information in the modern era we live in today.
So, any questions? Look, I'll, I'll be honest, I was more focused on your arms and I didn't really absorb any of that information. You know what? I am tired of this disrespect. I banish you from my store! Leave this place and never return or you will taste my blade!